I could t- couldn't sing, but I learned it from scripture and song. That's where it started. That's where my Christian life started was with uh, scripture and song. 1975. In fact, this is edition five. This started way back before then. But you know the great thing about it was it started in New Zealand. <laughs> How cool is that? However, there's a story to that, you know. There's a story. Uh, when I first came to church with Dawn, um, we were beginning to sing these songs of praise. And there was great controversy in the church. These songs were songs that began to get people to think about who God was, who Jesus was, and, oh my goodness, the Holy Spirit. (laughs) We were great at God the Father. We were great at God the Son. But we had a problem, in Baptist churches at least, with God the Holy Spirit in those days. And one of the things that I thought about as I've thought about what I wanted to say today was that we want to be thankful. And that song reminded us that we need to be thankful when we come into church each Sunday. But we want to be thankful more than just on a Sunday. We want to be thankful all the time. But what does it mean to be thankful? And when I thought about what it meant to be thankful, I was reading, Googling actually, which, you know, Josh has sort of given me this idea. (laughs) I Googled what it meant to be thankful and I came across some things to be thankful for that were written by a mother. And the first thing that this mother said was, I'm thankful for my automatic dishwasher. It makes it possible for me to get out of the kitchen but the family is looking for their next meal or their snacks after tea. I'm thankful for husbands. I'm glad about that. (laughs) They attack small repair jobs around the house and they usually make them big enough that I have to call in the professionals. She said, I'm thankful for children who put away their things and clean up after themselves. They are such a joy that you hate to let them go home to their parents. (laughs) For gardening, it's a relief to deal with dirt on the outside of the house. For teenagers... They give parents an opportunity to learn a second language. (laughs) I was listening to my grandson yesterday. He's got teaching me four languages. There is so much different. There's so many different languages that we need to learn because of our, our teenage young people. She also went on to say for smoke alarms, I let you know when the steak's done. And then another friend, I do have a couple of friends, and another friend sent me this, which is probably more age-appropriate for me. It was a a little thing about uh, humour for seniors. But there's a number of thankful aspects to this idea of humour for for seniors as well. And the first thing that this this, uh, friend said... Having uh, having plans sounds like a good idea until you have to put on clothes and leave the house. But I'm thankful that I have clothes and a roof over my head. It's weird being the same age as old people. (laughs) I'm thankful that old people are 10 years older than I am. When I was a kid, when I was a child, I wanted to be older. This is not what I expected. I'm thankful that I'm still learning. 
It's probably my age and wrinkles that tricks people into thinking I'm an adult. (laughs) I'm thankful that I don't have to try and keep up with my peers, but I can be myself. Never sing in the shower is this little story. Singing leads to dancing. Dancing leads to slipping. (laughs) Slipping leads to paramedics seeing you naked. (laughs) So remember, don't sing. I'm so thankful that while my singing now is awful and my body is no fashion statement, soon, and probably sooner rather than later at my age now, I'll be perfect, not only in the eyes of God, but my friends. I see my people, I see people my age climbing mountains. I feel good getting my leg through my underpants (laughs) without falling over. (laughs) Then after that mountain, I can still get out and walk and enjoy God's creation. You don't realise how old you are until you sit on the floor and try to get back up. (laughs) I'm thankful I can still roll over and get to the next leverage point and heave myself to my feet. Now we have a good laugh about those things. They are funny. (laughs) One day you will be there. (laughs) Some of us already are. But the big idea of this morning is this. One of the temptations of those who have been Jesus followers for any length of time is the danger of being accustomed to God's blessings. To take them for granted and fail to be thankful. We need to be thankful to God for just so much that has happened in our lives, don't we? Let me ask you today, what are you thankful for? This morning I have so much that I can be thankful for. A loving wife of 53 years. Two children. Five grandchildren, that's about it. There's not going to be any more, I've been told, well and truly. The blessing of being an Australian New Zealander, stall barrack for the All Blacks, the freedom to make choices in my life, my health, and a, a multitude of material blessings. What are you thankful for? I believe that there are many things, no matter what we see or hear, regardless of who we are and where you are on your life journey, whether you're just starting to check out this Jesus life or a lifetime on the Jesus journey, you and I ought to be thankful for this life that we have here. And that idea of being thankful, of saying thank you, is is one that sometimes is a bit difficult for us when we give thanks. How can we give thanks? Things haven't always gone well. How do we say thank you? Rudyard Kipling, who wrote a whole series of books, but particularly a series of jungle books that many of us remember from when we were children, and maybe even now we read to our grandchildren or our great-grandchildren was one of the very few authors who in fact uh, made a success of his writing while he was still alive. 
and one day um, a reporter came to him and he was a somewhat cynical reporter and he said, Mr. Kipling, Mr. Kipling, I, I have heard that your words that you have written are worth $100 per word. They are so valuable. And Rudyard Kipling looked at this guy and he said, really? And the reporter took out a $100 note, held it up and gave it to Kipling. Kipling took it, folded it up, put it in his pocket and said, thank you. Thank you is a $100 word. Thank you is something that we often forget. But it is worth so much. What have we been thankful for? How can we be thankful? Well, firstly, I believe we need to be thankful to God. Thankful to God for his goodness. His closeness to us. Thankful that I have to put, put glasses on to read. Psalm 25 says this. Show me how you work, God. School me in your ways. Take me by the hand. Lead me down the path of truth. You are my saviour, aren't you? Mark the milestones of your mercy and love, God. Rebuild the ancient landmarks. Forget that I sowed wild oats. Mark me with your sign of love. Plan only the very best for me, God. God is fair and just. He corrects the misdirected, sends them in the right direction. He gives the rejects his hand and leads them step by step. From now on, every road you travel will take you to God. Follow the covenant signs. Read the charted directions. Be thankful to God for his goodness toward us. You see, God isn't just a mere being. He's not only a mere power. He is not only even the mere creator of this world that we are in. He isn't this uncaused cause, but he is infinitely loving and wants a relationship with you, with me, with us. And that is an amazing thing for us to contemplate. This God who is this creator of our world, this God who sees all, is all, is in all, wants a relationship with you and with me. I find that amazing. And I'm so thankful that he wants that relationship. The second thing that we can be thankful to God for, and that's his love. 1 John 4, 8 in the New International Version says, He that loves not knows not God, for God is love. I wonder if you notice something in that little passage from 1 John. God and love are synonymous. They are the one thing. There is no separation. God and love are the same. And when you think about it, whatever God is, love is. And the only way that God's love makes sense is when we see it as personal, not mechanical. You know, he doesn't start your car when you're stranded on the side of the road, but he sits with you while you wait for the RAC. He wants to be with us. 
Some of you have heard me tell the story of Michael. Michael was a young man who came to us when, in our, um, when we were living in Tauranga in New Zealand. And uh, we lived in a church house that was on the property of the church. And outside of uh, that house, there was a sleep out. And Michael, who came from a really very well-respected family in the community. His dad was an architect and a very serious, seriously high-profile person in the community. They couldn't have children, so they adopted Michael. There was only one thing about Michael that really did disturb them. He wasn't quite as bright as his dad thought he ought to be. And his dad pushed him to the side. And he ended up in what we in New Zealand call Borstal, which is juvenile detention. And he came to us from juvenile detention, from Borstal, because he needed somewhere to stay. And somehow our pastor found uh, this young man and suggested that he might like to come and stay with Dawn and I and our two young children in the sleep out, which was fine. That that worked out really well. But the thing about Michael was he was violent. And he was in uh, detention for some pretty good reasons in reality. But there was something behind Michael that caused this to happen. And one of those things was absolute rejection by his family. So he came to live with us and uh, the very first time he came to us, his arm was in a plaster. And Michael, I saw him uh, get his bike, he brought his bike with him, get his bike out, it had a flat tyre. And he was so frustrated because his tyre was flat that he was smashing his broken arm with his cast against this tyre saying, why can't I fix this tyre? And to sit with him and to say to him, well, let's do it together, there was this immediate reaction to push away because that was what he experienced. And then one day, Michael at church decided he would get up before 11 o'clock and come to church. Church was just across the way. He was, uh, at this stage, he he was a a, um, a plumber's uh, mate. And uh, he he came as he was, dressed in his plumbing gear and his hobnail boots. And he came into church. Now, when he walked down the church in his hobnail boots, it was carpet. (laughs) It's not good. I don't know if you know what hobnail boots, but they're nails that are put into the bottom of the boot to give you grip. And as he walked down, of course, it picked up bits of carpet. And one of the leaders of the church, an older gentleman, now, you know, I know we can talk about older. He was old. (laughs) He was older than I was. He was probably probably about Ruth's age, but (laughs) remember, I was 24. But he was old. And he came to me afterwards and he said, how much longer are we going to have to put up with Michael in this place, wrecking our carpet? In those days, I was a bit arrogant about my faith. And I turned to him and I said, well, We're going to have to put up with him as long as it takes for him to come to know Jesus. It took a while for him to come to know Jesus, but he did. But one of the things that happened to Michael was he still had trouble with his temper. And one of our associates at the church at that time was a Maori guy called Truby. Truby Mahairi, a big six foot three Maori 
sergeant out of the army. He was a big boy. And one day Michael spat at him. Now this, I want you to put into context of the time. Today it would be abuse. Today it would be terrible. And it wasn't great then. But Truby picked this Michael up by his scruff, picked him up, pushed him against the wall and said, I love you in Jesus, don't you, you, don't you ever do that to me again, and put him down. Michael followed Truby wherever he went. Because why? Because Truby told him he loved him. And it was the beginning of the story of Michael coming to love Jesus. And he came and he gave himself to Jesus. But life wasn't always easy and we'll come to that a little bit later on. There's another part to his story. Whoever God is, love is. And then thirdly, how can we tell if we are truly thankful? 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 18 says, Be joyful always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. There's a little word in there that really only makes sense of that particular verse if we don't pass over it. What's the little word? Always. There's another smaller word. In. In all circumstances. Not because of all circumstances. Paul, writing to the people at Thessalonica. Paul, a guy who understood what it was to have hardship, to have difficulty in health, beaten, put into prison, could write this to the people who were also struggling and didn't always find life easy or much to be thankful for. But he said, be joyful always, pray continually, give thanks in all, in all circumstances. Sometimes when we are sitting in our circumstances, they are not always good. Sometimes we are sitting in our circumstances that are awful, that are painful, that are lonely that are frightening. Certainly not all circumstances are good and it's reasonable to ask why is it God's will that we be thankful in all circumstances. I was talking with our daughter Tania during the week and we, uh, just yesterday actually, and we were talking about some of these things that have happened in this past 10 days or so that have affected us in some way as a family and in our wider family. The first thing we're talking about was two young people who were killed in a car accident that were part of the Rolly Stone community. And one of those was somebody that we, Tania and I, used to see each week when she was managing the canteen and he would come up for his hamburger or whatever. And he died in that accident. His friend was also in the accident and died as well. And that community is grieving. How do you give thanks in that situation? One of the things that we discovered as we talked about that was that the community around them, the footy club particularly, gathered in and surrounded those families with love. 
the really tough thing for the mother of the young man who died as who was part of the footy club, Tom, Tom Safiotti, just about five years ago, her husband was on the footy field managing a club game and died. Just dropped dead on the footy field. And now she had to say goodbye to her son who was killed. Being thankful in all circumstances. That's tough. Tough without the community around you. Tough without the enveloping arms of those who love God and love you. And then we come to somewhat the other end of the spectrum in terms of age. Some of us this week have been thinking about those who have died in the last few weeks who are more towards our age or a bit older. And realising life is so precious, so good, so worth giving thanks for. In all circumstances. Not always easy. Sometimes it means just putting one foot in front of the other, in front of the other, in front of the other. Through a particularly tough time. We will be able to endure. We will be able to persevere in anything if we can be thankful in the tough times. So why am I thankful? I'm thankful for the taxes that I pay because it means I'm employed. I'm thankful for the sink full of dirty dishes I have enough to eat. The laundry basket that's overflowing means that I have clothes to wear. A lawn that needs mowing, windows fixing, gutters that need cleaning, I have a home. Even the spot that we have to take at the end of the supermarket car park, I'm thankful for because I'm able to walk from there. My heating bill, because I am warm. Waking up to the alarm, I'm alive! <laughs> the weariness and the aching muscles at the end of a day, it means I've been productive. Being thankful in all circumstances involves me seeing the God perspective. When we are thankful in all circumstances, we can be content. Remember the big idea of this morning? How can we be more thankful? To be mindful of the little things. In order to be mindful of the little things, we need to be thinking of the little blessings. Now, it's one thing that I was aware of, that I wasn't aware of previously, that the word think and thank have the same root word. And again, I went to Google. It's a Latin word, tangere. Think and think have the same root meaning. So we need to think about our thankfulness. We need to think about our God to whom we are thankful and for whom we are thankful. We need to think about the arms of those who are around us in this place because they love God and they, we, they love us. Mm. 
This, there is no gift too small when it comes from God, who is love, who is pure love. We might classify these blessings as being little, but in reality they are huge because they come from God. And if we have this attitude of thankfulness, we will see the little things as big blessings. In little things, they hold great value and significance when they have a God perspective to them. And what happened to Michael? The last time I saw Michael, he was on a slab in the mortuary. He had come to know Jesus, but he still lived in circumstances that made it very, very difficult for him to survive. And in the end, he overdosed and he died. What is there to be thankful about that? He knew Jesus. And he would not be rejected ever, ever again. That he would be welcomed into the arms of the Lord. So when we sit today, let's be thankful for who God is, what he has done. And in that thankfulness for the little things, hold them for their great significance, their inordinate value. Let's pray. Our loving God, who is the God of love, who is love, in all its manifestations. We thank you. Thank you that you gave yourself to us in Jesus. Thank you that you left us with an advocate in the Holy Spirit. And that as we go out from this place today, may we go with a sure sense that you have gone before us, are coming behind us, and love us. Amen.